Hey guys, it's Abdul, your favorite speech instructor with Abdul's Guide to Persuasive Speaking. As you all know, we got persuasive speeches coming up next week, uh, and since we won't be able to meet face to face, uh, the, the next best thing to be being there is me being on your television screen on this YouTube video clip. So I'm going to walk through two parts. Uh, first part is going over persuasion. Second part is going over how to structure your arguments, and we'll talk a little bit at the very end about your actual assignment. So. With that said, welcome to Abdul's Guide to Persuasive Speaking, Part 1. Well, to date, all the speeches you guys have done have been informative speeches. You've been basically giving the audience new and useful information you know, about yourself or about a topic, uh, but you haven't really, you have been playing it straight down the middle, just giving them that information. So in a way, you kind of been like a newspaper writer. See, this is a dailyplanet.com news site. There's a story about how Superman captures Lex Luthor. And the types of things we find in here, this is a news story, is who got captured, what happened, how it happened, you know, why, where, etc. So just the straight facts. Well now, we switch from that informative speaking, we're going over to persuasive speaking, which means you get to have an opinion, kind of like the editorial part, you know, of a news website. You know, Good Riddance to Bald Rubbish by Clark Kent. He's an editorial writer. And since Clark Kent is really Superman, he's making fun of Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor has no hair. He's bald. Okay, all right. That joke went over much better in the 8 o'clock class, by the way. So, but here, Clark Kent can have his opinion about Superman capturing Lex Luthor. But, even though it's an opinion, that opinion is still going to have to be based on facts. Otherwise, we don't have an informed opinion. So, if you think about it, even though this is persuasive speaking, it's still got a little bit of that informative element attached to it, you know, like we did in our previous speeches. And here's something else. You guys have already had a taste of persuasive speaking already when you gave your informative speeches. Because remember, you have to convince the audience to pay attention and to listen to you and why this is important. So even though we spent most of our semester on informative speeches, there was a little element of persuasion attached, now we switch gears with persuasive speaking with that, you know, thing about having our facts straight that we all get from informative speaking. So, with that said, what exactly is persuasion? Well, the definition is pretty simple. It's the process of influencing another person or person's behaviors, beliefs, values, or attitudes. <coughs> Oops. Let's do that. So we dramatically correct there. In an effort to get them to do, or in the alternative, not to do something. Now, there are two ways we can exercise this persuasive, you know, ability. We can use power, where we compel somebody to do something, or we can use influence, where we convince them to do something. I always say it's the difference between the way my parents treated me and my little brothers growing up. You know, Saturday morning, we're ready to go outside and play after watching cartoons, and my mom wants us to get our rooms clean. And so my dad would come in and say, hey, you boys get in there and clean your rooms or I'll smack you. He used power to compel us to behave. My mother would use influence. He'd say, hey, you boys get in there and clean your rooms or have your father smack you. And for some strange reason, it was always my youngest brother who's getting hit upside the back of the head, which explains quite a bit about him now as an adult. But since nobody's going to be physically knocking anybody upside the head, we're going to stick more with the influence route than the power route. <clears throat> so, how does this influence work? What can we do? Well, we can do is use influence for a number of things. We can use it to change somebody's attitudes, behaviors, or beliefs. We can use it to instill you know, certain beliefs or values or behavior. Or, we can intensify how they already feel about an issue. Now, with these three options, the most dramatic one, believe it or not, is actually change. Because if you think about it, when we change somebody's behavior or attitudes or beliefs, we're basically making them go from one way of thinking or doing something to another way. And still, they were neutral. So we're putting there in the first place, intensify, we're making it bigger, we're making it tougher. But change is the most dramatic way to influence someone. And the way we can do this is with one of three types of speeches. 
You guys remember call a speech to actuate or we influence somebody's behavior. A speech to convince or go for how somebody thinks. Then there's a third one. It's a speech to inspire. We're going on, we try to impact how somebody feels. So, what is persuasion? You know, it's influencing beliefs, behaviors, attitudes by changing and still intensifying via speech to actuate, convince, or inspire. For the most part, pretty straightforward stuff of what persuasion actually is. Where it gets a little tricky sometimes is motives. See, because in order for our persuasive message to work, we need to understand why people do the things that they do. And those are their motives. And with motives, there are kind of four things that you need to know. Number one, our motives differ. What's important to us today may not necessarily be what's important to us, you know, a few minutes from now. They're also ordered. You know, we have several things going on, but some things just at the moment are more important than others. And they also interact with each other. And sometimes it's not always cut dry. Say, for example, you're working in a place and somebody, a coworker comes up that you don't like and says, hey, the boss wants to give me a raise and I'll be your, in you know, a corner office and it'll make me your boss, but i got to pass the company test, but you know how to do it, will you help me? Nah. You probably tell that person where to go and what they can do with themselves when they got there. Probably. Now, here's where it gets a little different though. Let's say that same person you don't like comes to you and says, hey, can you help me take the company test so I can get a raise in the corner office? And by the way, they're going to move me to Juneau, Alaska. You might be motivated to help that person just a little bit more. So our motives tend to interact with each other. And sometimes, you even get this thing going on. It's called light and self-interest. What is enlightened self-interest? Well, basically, that's doing the right thing, not only because it's the right thing to do, but you also get a benefit from it. It's kind of like when Apple gives iPads to kids in the poor inner city schools or rural areas. Are they doing it for a tax write-off and to look good? Yeah, but you know what else they're doing? They're getting customers down the road. Because those little kids, if they remember that Apple computer, they're gonna buy another one, and then another one, and then another one. So, enlightened self-interest. And then number four, our motives are culturally influenced. In other words, where we're from, you know, kind of tends to also play a role on what's important to us. Where we're from, how we're raised, you know, our religious beliefs, a lot of that stuff. So you've got to understand these principles of motives in order to understand how the different motivational appeals work. In other words, you know, how can we reach people to get them to do you know, what we want them to do, or the alternative, you know, get them to do something, or in the alternative, not to do something. Well, we've got a number of them, one of which is altruism. That's when you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do with no expectation of reward. Now, there's a question as to whether altruism really exists, like are you helping people because it's the right thing to do, or will I help people because it makes me feel good? Well, which one is it? Well, that's one of those conversations you have at 3 o'clock in the morning at grad school after pizza and funny cigarettes. Number two. Fear and safety, another very powerful motivational appeal. Let's think about the presidential race. Half of America voted for one person because they're afraid of the one woman. The other half of America voted for the woman because they're afraid of the other guy. Fear, safety. I call this one your parental motivation. Individuality and conformity. It's the be your own person, you know, don't follow the pack, individuality. Or as my dad would say, son, 
If all your friends were jumping off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge too? Of course not, Dad. I'd be down at the bottom of the bridge so I could collect their wallets and take the money out of their pockets. Come on, be serious here. The next thing you know, pff, ouch, that hurt. Conformity, that's peer pressure, go along with the group. Number four. Power, control, and influence. And actually, believe it or not, the motivational appeal here is not so much that people want control and influence or power over other people. A lot of times they just want over their own lives. Like the finances, weight, you know, get the families kind of in chaos. So remember watch those stupid Dr. Phil shows? A lot of that is what's going on there. That's another one. Self-esteem, achievement, and approval. We want to feel good about ourselves. We want other people to feel good about us. And this is why if you go to a college's website like Ivy Techs in March, you look at some of the pictures on the main page of the website, you see people graduating. And there's just a mom who's got the kids hugging her. Yeah, because guess what? Mom didn't get a chance to finish school when the kids were young, so she wants to feel better about herself. Wants to some achievement. And wants that family approval. Ta-da. Okay. Quick show of hands. Who here has ever done something stupid because you thought you were in love with somebody? Ta-da. Hands up, don't you? Yeah. Love and affiliation. Matter of fact, back in the mid-1990s, when MTV actually still used to play music videos, there was this thing called Tag Body Spray, was one of the commercials. And as long as you didn't use it near an open flame, you know, you wouldn't turn into the human torch. So, the commercial is the guy would be like in the store, he put on the Tag Body Spray, then all the hot chicks would just come running all over, tear off all his clothes. So here's 24-year-old Abdul at the Target in Springfield, Illinois. And so there's a Tag Body Spray, so I go, tss. All right, ladies, dinner time. Who wants some? I got nothing. Well, I did get something. I got an old lady telling me I was in front of her denture cream and I needed to move and she was smacking me with her purse. But I got nothing. <laughs> All that because of love and affiliation. <laughs> this course, people, financial gain. You know, people do lots of things for money, some good, some bad. And also status. You know, live in this neighborhood, buy this watch, wear these clothes, drive this car. Everybody will think you're something you're probably not. And then there's this thing called self-actualization. That's sort of the be-all you can be. It's a model the, old, the Army used to use. That's another you know, motivation. People try to find out themselves and who they are. But as you can see, there are lots of different things that motivate people to do different things. The trick is just to know which one is important for them so your, so your message can adapt accordingly. Any questions so far? So all this makes sense. Got my email address, so if we do something that's not making sense, you be sure to let me know, and I'll explain it to you. So, we know what persuasion is, we know about these different motivational appeals. But there's some other things to keep in mind. Camera's okay? It's giving me... Ah, just checking with the camera guy in case there's a technical glitch. All right, write this sentence down, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to say this. You can't know what you want to change, or I'm sorry, you can't know how to change your audience until you know what it is you want to change. I'll say that again, or you can rewind the YouTube clip. You can't know how to change your audience until it is you know exactly what it is you want to change. All right, what does that mean? Well, that means 
You've got to have a persuasive goal. In other words, what exactly are you trying to influence? Are you trying to influence their values? Their attitudes? Their beliefs? Or their behaviors? If you don't know which one of those three things you're trying to fix or trying to target, then your persuasive message is going to get lost. Well, that's why it's really important to remember, like I said, you can't know how to change your audience until you know what exactly it is that you want to change. Now this right here is an interesting concept. It's called the social judgment theory. Now, what is that? Well, let me share it with you. There are a lot of people with PhDs that go to school to learn what regular people learn know through common sense. This is one of those things, the social judgment theory. And what happened was a bunch of people who got PhDs in communication, or doctor this and doctor that, spent a lot of hours, doing a lot of research, to come up with this. We tend to judge or evaluate messages based on beliefs we already hold. Yes, a bunch of people sat down, did thousands of hours of research to come up with that common sense. That if your best friend gives you some advice, he's a genius. If your dad or mom gives you the same advice, they're these horrible, evil, ogre people trying to control your life and tell you what to do and make your life just a miserable living hell. Exactly. Now, how exactly does this work? Well, remember day one, the whole sender, receiver thing from way, way back then? Well, I got a sender here, and my receiver's over here, but this little circle represents the receiver's anchor beliefs. This is everything they believe in, everything that they hold dear. That's their universe. Like an anchor on a boat keeps you grounded from drifting off, or the gravity kind of holds you down, stops you from floating into outer space. But, like a rocket ship, when it goes in outer space, you know, the gravity isn't as, isn't as uh, powerful, and so you're not as grounded. So this first little level up here, we call the latitude of acceptance. Because everything inside this circle, this is stuff you're cool with. You'll have a problem. It may not be your hardcore value beliefs, but you're okay with it. Go a little further out. We call this the latitude of non-commitment. In other words, you're neutral. You don't have an opinion or you don't care. Because it's just something that doesn't concern you or just isn't in your wheelhouse. But we go out another step over here, and then we get what's called the latitude not acceptance. It's like, uh uh, no way, no how, not going to happen. Like, for example, my wife and I were talking about getting married eight years ago, and I asked her if I could keep my girlfriends. Guess where that idea ended up? That's right. That idea ended up in the latitude of non-acceptance. I ended up on the floor with a knot on my head. So my wife decided to grab the iron and start playing Thor like in the movies. The next thing you know, bam, I see rainbows in Asgard. So, <clears throat> what happens here? Well, like I said, we got our sender who's sending a message. Except this time, 
it's a persuasive message because we're trying to get them to do, or in the alternative, not to do something. But underneath that persuasive message, is that persuasive meaning. And that message has to filter through all this stuff to get to there. And then once it gets there, guess what? We judge messages based on beliefs we already hold. So our receiver is going to take that message and file it in one of these three areas based on what they think. Now, here's what gets a little tricky. Let's say I'm sending my receiver a message that I know they won't agree with, that they just find it you know, reprehensible. The best I can hope for is to land in that latitude of non-commitment, because then hopefully they won't say no. They'll keep an open mind. They won't say, they definitely won't say yes, but at the very least, they won't say no. Because here's the news flash. When somebody changes their mind about an issue, that never happens. Real change, slow steps, long periods of time. If you ever think about a time you had an opinion about something and you really changed your mind about it, you really didn't do it instantaneously, you probably really had to think about it and ponder it. Now, even though we've got these you know, different circles right here, this isn't necessarily to scale. You know, different people have different latitudes. For example, somebody who's probably really open-minded has a big latitude of acceptance. Whereas somebody who's closed-minded you know, maybe not so much. But the worst person are these people. Passive-aggressive, can't make up their mind about anything. Hey, what are we doing tonight? I don't know. It doesn't really matter because we're just going to do what you want to anyway. Like, uh... <laughs> Camera guy knows exactly what I'm talking about. But the main thing is, we have these different latitudes, and whenever we send there a persuasive message, it's going to fall in one of these three categories. It's a message your person may not agree with. You always want to shoot for that latitude of non-commitment. Any questions? All this making sense? Of course it is. But you got my email address and my phone number, just in case. So we know what all this persuasive stuff is, but what's the right strategy to use to get our message out? Well, luckily, you don't have to think about that too hard. Because guess what? It's already been done. Matter of fact, strategy is almost 3,000 years old. There's an old Greek guy named Aristotle. 2,800 years ago, he wrote a book. Name of the book was called the rhetoric. And the thing about the rhetoric was that basically, to one degree or another, there are pretty much three persuasive speaking strategies that you can use to convince somebody to do something, or the alternative, not do something. And you're about to get your first Greek lesson of the day. You'll get a Latin one later. They're called ethos, logos, and pathos. What does that mean, Abdul? Well, ethos is your speaker credibility. In other words, we believe this because of who our speaker is. It's like Donald Trump, actually it's one of the things that Donald Trump and Barack Obama have in common. A lot of the people who believe what they say and really like them is just because of who they are and their personality. Logos is just logic, logic and reason. You can see the L-O-G.
And pathos is that emotional appeal. We kind of tug at the heartstrings a little bit to get people to go along with the program. So fundamentally, like I said, this was written almost 3,000 years ago, you know, your basic strategy appeals. Now, here's the thing. Because this is Greek, students can figure out the logos part, but they'll see the E and they'll think emotional appeal and get a little confused. Here's the easy way to remember. Good drawing. Mm Yes, deep down inside your favorite speech instructor is a very, very, very frustrated comic book artist. Just ask his wife to all the sketch pads laying around the house and colored pencils. Think about Star Trek, Captain Kirk is ethos, Kirk shows up, the green women all drops his feet, the Romulans run like heck, Mr. Spock is logical, and Dr. McCoy is the emotional basket case. Dr. Jim, I'm a doctor, not a fill in the blank. Ethos, logos. Take those. And for those of you on equal time, there's your Klingon. Ta da! <laughs> now, once you got the ethos, logos, and pathos picked up, by the way, there are the transporter disappearing. You want to make sure, as you put all this stuff together, you have what I call your persuasive checklist. In other words, these are the things you want to make sure you do in your speech presentation. The first one, and by the way, some of this you'll remember, from uh, our informative speaking days. The first one is establish credibility. You know, make sure the audience knows that you're a credible source. Now there are three types of credibility. There's what's called initial, that you get at the beginning of your speech. Derived, that you get while you're speaking. And terminal, that you get at the end of your presentation. You always want to go for initial credibility because the audience will never pay attention to you as much as when they start listening. Derive, the terminal, you could put some information out, but by then it's too late. So you always want to go for the initial credibility. We also want to convey confidence. You know, we want our audience to know that we're confident, that we know what we're talking about. How do we do that? We cite our sources, ladies and gentlemen. We let people know where we got our information from. And by the way, the audience should trust you and the information that you're giving. If they don't, you got a problem. And it can't just be one. It's got to be both. It's kind of like you know, somebody you know who you like, but they tell you a story that you don't believe, then the message doesn't work. It's got to, audience has to trust you and your information. It also helps to be a little bit more of a dynamic speaker. Nobody likes to listen to somebody who's dry and boring. If you're dry and boring, 
It's not going to fly. Number five. Yeah. Focus your goals. Those three main points we talked about. You know, your main point, your general purpose, specific purpose. You always want to stay on point. Because the more you kind of stray off base, the more you start to wander, the less you connect with your audience, the less they pay attention, the less effective you are as a speaker. And speak of your audience. We always try to connect with our listeners. In other words, we always want to make sure that when we talk to our audience, that we're making that connection so they pay attention. How do we do that? Well, like I said, we find out what motivates them, we find out what's important to them. Number seven, organize your argument. And we'll talk about argument in just a few minutes here. When we say your argument, we're talking about your main points, which is primacy and recency. Primacy is, means you put a most important argument first. Recency means we put it second or last. Once again, people never pay attention to you as much as they do when the, you can start talking. So just like that initial credibility, that main argument at the very beginning, because you always want to start strong, come right out the gate. Don't forget to support your ideas. You know, those things we talk about with evidence. Your main point, you know, facts, data, statistics, personal stories. Things that, once again, make your presentation more credible. But don't also forget You know, the emotional appeal. You know, a little bit of emotional appeal goes a long way. It's like seasoning on food. You sprinkle just enough to really keep them captivated and paying attention. Not so much that it tastes like a big block of salt, Peter. Don't ask me how I know what that tastes like. I just do. And number 10, always remember to use that effective delivery. We know that verbal, non-communicative, verbal and non-verbal communication, eye contact, delivery, you know, movement, hand gestures, all those things we talked about in previous semesters. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen, does all this make sense? Remember, got my email, got my phone number. So, this is Abdul's Guide to Persuasive Speaking, Part 1, where we lay all the groundwork for our persuasive speaking. We take ourselves a couple-minute break, and then we'll come back. When I got persuasive speaking, part two.